Okay. Everyone, I'd like to say a few words of introduction about Senator Pressler. He is the former U.S. Senator from South Dakota. He was a member of Congress for 22 years and the first Vietnam veteran to be elected to the U.S. Senate. In 2000, Senator Pressler was a member of George W. Bush's Information Technology Steering Committee, and he also served on the Bush presidential transition team in 2001. He was appointed as an official observer of Ukraine's national election uh, during the Orange Revolution in uh, December 2004. Uh, Senator Pressler currently serves on several corporate boards and is a visiting professor and senior fellow at UCLA. In 2009, President Obama named Larry Pressler to the U.S. Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad. And in 2010, he was appointed to the board of Jericho Project's Veterans Advisory Council, which assists homeless veterans in the Bronx in New York City. Educated at Harvard Law School, Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and uh, University of Oxford, and the University of South Dakota, Senator Pressler is also a Fulbright senior lecturer and has been awarded numerous medals and citations for his two tours of duty as a U.S. Army lieutenant. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Senator Larry Pressler. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Mark Donfried, if you're here. He has just stepped out. He has just stepped out. Just okay, that's good. <laughs> Uh, I'm very honored to be able to say a few words to you, but I also want to listen to you. I feel youth in this room. I'm almost 70 years of age, so I'm starting to appreciate more and more our young people. And uh, I brought with me this morning a book I am just reading, uh, The Last Great Senate. I know that's not quite your, uh, your cup of tea, but it's about our uh, Senate. Uh, in the, and I was a member of this, and this particular writer feels that uh, we had a great Senate from 1976 to 1980, but that's a debatable, but it's a good, a good read, and I recommend it to you. But I brought it along because uh, I think uh, uh, some of the things that uh, are happening in our elections are, are things that you should well, and obviously are observing, and I know a lot of you are from other countries. Um, I, I, I made a few uh, notes to uh, uh, sort of give you a rundown on what I think is happening in cultural diplomacy. And to me, that means people talking to each other. It means uh, 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 student exchanges. It means aid programs. It means diplomacy. And uh, uh, it means uh, both our uh, military and our uh, civilian side being very sensitive to cultural issues. I am honored to serve on the uh, President Obama's Commission for American Heritage Abroad, which works with the State Department and the CIA and, and the Defense Department on, uh, on, sensitive, on certain sensitive matters of relations uh, among nations. We recently had a project uh, regarding um, um, uh, regarding monuments and grave sites. There are some countries in the world where uh, graves are still uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, it's usually people of Jewish descent or Muslim descent. Uh, and, and countries uh, ranging in Kosovo to Poland to, to, um, and, to, and, and in the United States. But that's an issue of great sensitivity uh, among some countries. We also have uh, the great budgetary struggles that are going on in the United States and in Europe. And uh, I think that this is directly related to cultural diplomacy because we have to have enough money to pay for some of it. But more importantly, we have to balance our budgets, uh, which is not a very exciting subject, but we have to work at it every day to, uh, so we can have sound economies. And I feel very much as though the United States is heading down the same road as some European countries uh, unless we either reduce our spending or enhance our revenue. And uh, it's hard to do. We haven't really made much progress yet. In fact, uh, 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 I'm giving a speech next week in Cheyenne, Wyoming. The, uh, the state legislature out there and the Chamber of Commerce have asked me to give an assessment of what's happening with all the budgetary talks in Washington, D.C. Well, very little has happened. There's been much talk. Uh, President Obama's uh, new budget, it, it doesn't vary very much from past ones. There was a good commission called the Bowles-Simpson Commission. 
it has been pretty much uh, thrown in the wastebasket. I, I, I hate to be so candid, but the president didn't put the numbers in his budget, and, and the Republicans didn't uh, take it up. And uh, we seem to be just floating down the road to more deficit spending, which eventually is going to cause great inflation, which will cause there to be less jobs, which will cause our standard of living and, and our culture to lower. So I think the greatest thing we can do in cultural diplomacy is to set an example. I mean, usually we think of ourselves uh, from our country as going abroad and advising somebody in the Peace Corps or uh, in, some, in some other capacity, and that's very important. But it's also very important that we set an example, and I know that the dullness of uh, fiscal responsibility is, uh, is not a subject that uh, a lot of you probably, th that excites very many audiences. In fact, in 1978 when I was in the Senate, uh, we used to have some balanced budgets and uh, we would keep, I kept a debt in my office so that I would vote for only, I would have to vote for more taxes if I voted for more spending over a certain amount. But what we have in the United States is sort of a deadlock, the, generally speaking, every, everything, and I, I'm not very partisan anymore, I'm almost an independent, I'm still very much a Republican. But generally speaking, we have the, the Democrats, they will not yield on cuts in Social Security or more advanced uh, agents in retirement, nor in Medicare, and the Republicans won't budge in terms of any revenue enhancements. And this is a very serious situation. Um, now, at a great distance, I know that Europe is also struggling, and many other countries are struggling with this. Let me say that at a distance, I very much admire Mrs. Merkel of Germany, may I say, uh, who I think is doing a great job. And somebody, by the way, everything I say, somebody can stand up and rebut later. That's the great <laughs> thing, because uh, I'm going to say a thing or two about some uh, our presidential race and so forth, although that's not my main purpose. I know you are diplomats and dip on the diplomatic side, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this, uh, this, is what, uh, this is where it uh, comes from. Let me say a word or two about the need of our young people to join a political party. More and more in the United States and maybe elsewhere, people are turned off by politics, by involvement. And more and more people say they're independents. In fact, I just said I felt like an independent. I would like to be, but it's very important that we join. I just tell my students, uh, it's very important that you join a political party. You won't agree entirely with one and work to make it a better thing. Why join the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? To make it better. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, the parties will nominate the next president of the United States. At the end of the day, the parties will nominate who will be senators and congressmen. There might be one or two exceptions in the whole United States to that rule. And if all the good people, the moderates, all drop out of the two parties, then we have what we are seeing in the Republican primaries and what we saw to some extent in the Democratic primaries, a very small number of people actually making the decision. And, that did, and if you really think it through, uh, it's really a responsibility, I think, of young people to do something about that. And I tell you, and my, part of my solution, my solution to problems is that there is no real easy solution that takes day by day work, day in, day out, year in, year out. And that's true of diplomacy as well. But it's certainly true of politics. And now we have a very apathetic public in the United States, a very lazy and apathetic public. And, uh, uh, everybody tells the public it's so wise. Well, the newscasters tell the public it's wise because they're, se they're trying to get more eyeballs for selling advertisements. Politicians tell the public it's very wise because they want to get more votes. Everybody has an incentive to tell the public it's very wise. The public has not been acting very wise because it's largely dropping out of decisions other than complaining. And that's especially true in our electoral process. Now let me say a few words about, uh, and by the way, I was a Fulbright professor. Uh, I was uh, honored to be a Rhodes Scholar when I was a young man. But I was a Fulbright uh, professor recently in Italy. And they moved that Fulbright professorship to an Arab country, which they should. Uh, which, uh, but in any event, um, um, we have a situation in the United States in which more and more of our people are dropping out not only of uh, politics, but of cultural diplomacy, of everything. 
And this is a very serious situation. I don't know if Europe has the same, the same uh, problem, but um, uh, uh, it troubles me a great deal. Now we have the presidential campaign, but budgetary issues are not being defined in that, in that presidential campaign. We don't have enough people who are interested, or our news media is, it doesn't work hard enough. And some of you, I hope, will become journalists because I think we need good journalists. But we really need to uh, come to grips with uh, uh, our spending priorities. And uh, uh, one thing in the current presidential race and past ones, and I'll, I'll throw this out and somebody here can rebut me later, but there's a phenomenon going on. And that is the phenomena of Ron Paul, a Republican candidate. He had been, uh, but he has immense support from young people, and young people from Ivy League colleges, uh, uh, Dartmouth, Harvard, Yale, and from West Coast colleges, Stanford, uh, from, from colleges in the Midwest, like uh, well, uh, well-off colleges, uh, not so much the state universities. But why is this? Well, there's a key part to his philosophy, and that is less foreign intervention. And he would bring the troops home from Afghanistan, Iraq. He would bring most of the troops home from Europe. He would not. Uh, 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 he would still be foreign. He would still be involved very much. And he's not an isolationist. He emphasizes. But this is not really reported very much in our mainstream media. Our mainstream media kind of repeats over and over. They're basically uh, uh, oriented towards the Democratic Party, except for one or two organs. And news is really not news. It's really uh, uh, kind of a rehash of people's preconceived notions. But in any event, nobody has really reported on who supports Ron Paul. And some of you people in this room might correct me. But it appears to me, and I heard, uh, I was at the Council on Foreign Relations the other day, the people who most enthusiastically support him are uh, his core, are young people, college age, who believe that we have spent too much money overseas, we've been too militarily involved overseas, we should shift that to cultural diplomacy. And that is, uh, that is not people discredit Ron Paul. Well, he's, that's part of his movement, or his, that's a part of it. And another part of it is individual liberties, which I think they're daydreaming a little bit, uh, because we're such a big, complex society. <clears throat> but in any event, I throw that out to you, because that's a phenomenon that it's hard for me to explain or to fully understand. Uh, but uh, uh, I think this is good that they're, they're involved. I just hope they stay with the Republican Party or the Democratic Party and do not become sort of opting, opting out. It's so easy to opt out. Uh, but someone here may, I hope during our question and answer, someone here who is on a campus, an American campus, will say, tell me that I'm all wet about that. But I'm just repeating what I heard at the Council on Foreign Relations the other day. Um, let me say that I think that ethics and honesty on the part of our government about what we're doing and why we're doing it is very important, not just, but our whole society. Why do we have the military industrial state? Is it to defend ourselves or is it to build, is it to please uh, contractors to build more weapons in certain states? Uh, do we, what are our real objectives? Uh, is it, uh, uh, our foreign policy is really not defined these days. Uh, uh, and then we have a lot of things that happen that uh, we just don't come to grips with in terms of honestly accepting. And here, here is something else. Uh, let's take Haiti. After all the aid from all over the world and Europe and all the NGOs, uh, there are more NGOs in Haiti working in the last two years. The real numbers, the real statistics on Haiti have not improved very much. Uh, let's take several African countries. After years of uh, traditional aid and assistance, the things that have changed have come, have come about either through business or through free enterprise or who knows what, maybe something else. I'm just throwing that out. Some things, aid has been successful in some cases. But we have to be real honest with ourselves what we're trying to do and what works and where we should go from here. So I think in this whole business of diplomacy, some real analysis, uh, some, uh, and, and uh, I tend to think that it works in more cases than it doesn't. We have to keep trying. But in terms of human relationships, 
every government is flawed. I mean, every uh, government in the world has great flaws and will have. But we have to just keep working away honestly as best we can. Um, the uh, I, I represent in my state a large number of Native Americans, and they feel strongly that they have not been respected in terms of cultural heritage, in terms of their grave sites, in terms of their art, in terms of their culture that they want to preserve. And that's a, something that we in the United States, we, we can't run giveaway programs eternally, but we can respect and elevate that because whether it's in Massachusetts or wherever, uh, or, uh, the Native Americans have not been treated right and that is something that we need to correct as an example of honesty and, 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 and going forward. Um, I might touch briefly, and I'm sure you all do, on Afghanistan. Uh, I personally strongly opposed our entry into Afghanistan. Uh, I strongly oppose our entry into Iraq. Uh, and I, I, I'm afraid I wouldn't be for any involvement militarily in Syria. It's a, a terrible situation. I don't know what to do. This. Some of these things don't have solutions. Usually a political speech will have some, will, will, will have some dramatic conclusions. Uh, I hope that Egypt is able to work its way gradually through. Uh, and there again, uh, I certainly don't uh, support uh, our uh, military involvement. <clears throat> we, we have a lot of military aid there, which is part of the problem. Uh, probably uh, less than that if I, had, <clears throat> if I had my druthers. So around the world, uh, we have, for example, I think that you heard some say, things about the Fulbright program. I think that has been an excellent approach. And I think that is to expand on that sort of thing. But we don't have very many Fulbright people in Arab-speaking countries. We, don't have, we haven't gone very, very far forward in training Arab speakers in the United States. That's another thing we've talked a lot about. So we've been kind of talking in, in, in circles to some extent without achieving. So we need some accomplishments. We need you and other young people from throughout the world to come into positions uh, in politics and wherever else. And in most democracies, the way to really have influence on on public policy is to run for office, and that's hard to ask young people to do because politics has become a negative uh, campaign. I mean, you have to engage, unfortunately. We see it in the presidential uh, contest. It's The media loves it and they feed it. But it's uh, very few issues are being discussed, and this is tragic. We, we need a good presidential campaign, and I hope the, the general election is better than the primaries have been. But remember, each party has problems in their primaries. Just a few years ago, the Democrats had eight people running, and they call them the, the media called them the eight dwarfs. And out of them emerged Barack Obama, and he won. So uh, this is a it, it's a messy business, but it will we will have a good presidential race uh, eventually. But I hope uh, and, and I hope that our media will keep it will try to keep it on uh, on the issues. You know, you can blame Congress or blame uh, the politicians, and there's plenty to blame. But they are there, and they're going to stay there, and that's how we make our decisions. And so that's where all this talk of, oh, how awful Congress is, how awful the media is, that's an escape conversation. And I would like to do that too, but you can't walk away from it. We have to, in, a, in our lives, we have to figure, in our careers, we have to figure out where we are and, and where we're going and do the best we can. And most of us, that means plodding along every day. And this is true in diplomacy. Uh, a lot of good things have happened, and a lot of good things are happening. It's the best time in world history uh, uh, to, to be on the face of the earth, uh, in spite of all the problems here and there. Some might debate that. But uh, a lot of good things are happening. Uh, we do see a lot of uh, positive things. A lot of countries have come a long way. Uh, I think that uh, the world is talking to each other more. I don't know if there's a, uh, always a positive result of that. We have the, 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 the great potential, but it's going to take a lot of unglamorous work on the part of citizens to not just vote, but to inform themselves, to inform themselves. It's going to take a lot of work on the part of our young diplomats and 
professors and, and teachers. Um, and, and maybe that's my um, maybe that's my message as much as anything is that the way our news is presented to us it's so dramatic it's always a crisis it's always this and that but the real solution is plodding along day after day doing honestly what we're supposed to be doing saying what our motives are in foreign policy or in, or in building weapons or in diplomacy or whatever else and uh, uh, I have great hope in the human spirit. So that is my message, but I'll be glad to take uh, some questions. Or, yes, good, I see some hands already. Maybe somebody's gonna correct me on Ron Paul here. Go ahead. Um, my name is Catherine Cassidy. I live in Maine. Uh -huh. Third time in 2012. I am a candidate for Maine Public Radio. Mm -hmm. I live the Maine House of Representatives. Good for you. But I'm a Democrat, so <laughs> <Okay>. well. <laughs> I didn't make it the last two times. Um, last year, for the first time, um, I drove across South Dakota and Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you. And the picture of your your former Democratic senator Ed Muskie is right there. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned ethics and honesty in government. Um, before the conference, I did the quick version of research about you. I looked at Wikipedia, <laughs> and what fascinated me was a bit about the bribery. Can you talk to that, please? Well, um, one of the reasons I'm asked to give speeches on ethics sometimes is that. I once stumbled into a situation where I turned down a bribe flatly on tape and it was a, a sting that uh, anybody could have been involved in and so I had 15 minutes of fame back in the, it was called the Abscam bribery episode and I was sort of made a national hero by Walter Cronkite and lots of other people for, it's 15 minutes of fame so I thank you very much for knowing about that, that's pretty amazing. Uh, but. Yes, well, uh, uh, it was, <laughs> and I said some very good things uh, on that day. I don't know, it's, it, it's illegal to do anything in exchange for any action in Congress. This was a group that wanted to get some visas, and they wanted to get some, they said, and uh, some other matters. And I don't really talk about it very much in my own speeches, but I'm invited to speak on the subject of ethics because you've you got to be pretty, uh, but I said at the time, this is pretty sad if this makes one a hero or if he should be, because everybody here would do the same thing I did, I believe, but not everyone did, I, I guess. But the point is, um, 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 the basic point is that, uh, and by the way, the state of Maine is known for its, uh, nobody in Maine has ever told a lie, I don't think, have they? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So anyway, but it's kind of an uncomfortable thing because should you be a hero because you turned down a bribe? Uh, I don't think so, and I don't think I'm any more ethical than anybody else. But uh, anyway, this was, uh, that was that situation. Thank you very much for knowing about that. Wikipedia is not always right, but I like Wikipedia, and uh, I, know, I tell my students they can use it, but they have to get other references. But I think it has, and, and by the way, Wikipedia is shutting down the other day. I'm a volunteer advisor to Wikipedia, you might say, in terms of, and I want them to survive and to prosper. And uh, this Hollywood crowd on, on copyrights, patents, and trademarks, that's another story. They spend all this money down here in Washington, and they've got things that they would, students have to spend $200 per textbook, which they should spend $10, but, and the professor who wrote it doesn't get the money, it goes to companies, and it's outrageous. Uh, the way uh, intellectual property is tied up and nobody, that, that's an apathetic public, nobody knows about it, but Wikipedia finally shut down for a day uh, and that brought some attention to two bills that those, that our good friends from the Motion Picture Association were sponsoring. Yes, yeah. go ahead, I'm going to give shorter answers, but thank you very much, you made my day knowing that. Hi. <laughs> my name is Kevin Sigley and I, I wanted to, uh, I was hoping that you might speak a little bit on the issue of, of politics in America. Um, I, I understand and respect what what I believe is a real politic view vis-a-vis -vis the party system, um, but as an independent voter myself and being active in independent politics, um, it seems to me as if the two-party system itself is a little outdated um, for what we're dealing with right now. And I do know that a lot of the younger people, myself included, are shying away from the, the party because we see them as simply propagating their own, you know, staying in power themselves rather than actually addressing the issues. And I know that, you know, using the example of Ron Paul, a lot of the younger voters 
spurred on by the rapid change in social media, of walking away from the party system and towards simply just apathy or you know the, 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 the occupy movement. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, do you really see the future of American politics resting in the closed party system, or do you see a little bit of opening? And, you know, I come from Michigan, which has you can't split your ballot, but independents can still vote. But I know in a lot of other states, I don't know about South Dakota, some of the primaries are closed, meaning you can't vote. So that in and of itself might yeah. Mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I respect people's right to be an independent, and Michigan has a, an open primary, as I understand it, so that you can choose one or the other ballot, mm -hmm. and that's fine. And I'm not for somebody being a hardcore Republican or a hardcore Democrat. Recently, some students up at Baruch College in New York asked me, why join a party? And I said, to improve the parties. You know, John F. Kennedy made his famous speech in which he said, ask not what you can do for your country, ask what you can uh, ask what you can do for your country, not, and not what you can do for yourself. Same thing is true of parties. So they're bad, they're, they're weak, but young people, can, by joining them and participating, can hopefully improve them just by being, being a member. Now your basic question is, are the parties old-fashioned or are they out of fa fashion? I think the parties will, they may well be, and they need to maybe change some things, but they're here to stay. And uh, the parties, everybody who's going to be elected next November in the United States of America will be elected by a party originally. Some people change to independent after they're elected, but very few get elected as independents. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't be an independent, but I say that as a practical fact. And you can remember you heard this here. During your lifetimes, I would predict that parties will, be, will nominate the candidates for Congress and the presidency and the governors. Therefore, I would behoove you to join a party and try to improve it. Now, it's hard to join, like me, I'm a, I'm a, I was a moderate Republican in the Senate back in these days. I'd probably be a liberal Republican now, I don't know what it would be. I probably couldn't get elected now, but uh, <laughs> anyway, the atmosphere is very negative, but I have not heard any solution other than to stick with a two-party system, and I don't know what we'd replace it with. Uh, now, being partisan is not so bad. For example, the dominant media that I'm talking about, uh, uh, most of the media, uh, um, they would be, they would sort of condemn <coughs> partisanship. But on the other hand, they like Harry Truman, who was very partisan. I mean, to give him hell, Harry, and so forth. But our system is built to be partisan. There should be creative tension between the parties. There should be alternatives, uh, and, and of course it gets carried too far. But uh, uh, I'm almost 70 years old, and uh, I'm uh, uh, suitable for retirement and burial, but uh, <laughs> I see no, t t t and I can agree, everybody saying the parties are terrible, the country's in terrible shape, uh, let's all be independents and let's drop out and let's not vote. Um, uh, and just vote, because it's good not to vote if you're not informed. I think an uninformed vote is, is very dangerous. Yes, you're giving me a signal. Should I speak I'd more? Like, I'd like to ask a question. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> did did uh, I answer I mean, your question? Because these are good you, questions. Do you, yeah. you honestly believe that, that people will start going back to the parties, though? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I understand why one should do that. Um, I just, I have a little bit of, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not convinced that people will. They may not go back to the parties, but we will have an increasingly uh, deteriorating society, educationally, culturally, financially, if they're not more active. The, I think, the, I predict that the parties will stay, that uh, when you're 70 years old, you're going to be uh, voting. And, and of course, there's nothing wrong with being an independent and going to vote in a primary, but by participating, then you're participating in a party. In the pri go and getting a ballot, Democrat or Republican, switching back and forth. We need independents also, but uh, they should vote in the primaries. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And almost nobody votes in the primaries. I mean, these uh, the three primaries that Rick Santorum won in three states. One state had 400. Got, he had 400 votes. For, of course, it was a caucus. You have 400 people in a whole state came to a meeting. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> that's not very many, but. Uh, so then we lose all the moderate Republicans and all the moderate Democrats. 
And um, uh, uh, so I plead with you, that's one thing, but I see no other solution than to either join the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, or ask for a, a ballot uh, during the primary time. And that's a little bit of bureaucratic work because usually you have to, well, you, you have to register and so on and so forth. And, uh, I just see no, that's one place where I disagree with the general, the general truths that are, it's, it's a generally accepted truth that the parties are going to go somewhere, but what are we going to replace them with? I mean, they will still be nominating candidates. They will be nominating the candidates for President of the United States in 2062 when, when I'll be gone and you'll be here, but the parties will still be nominating our candidates. Would you support opening primaries? Yes, yes, I would, yes. I, I would like to see that happen, but that fits in with my thesis of, Yes, I, I would like to see that. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry, I know you had a question. Thank you, Senator. My name is Mahmoud. I'm from Afghanistan. And my Good. question is with regard to the engagement of the United States and the military campaign of the war in Europe. Uh, sir, it's been like almost a half a since the 9 11, and the United States uh, war against terrorism and is engaging with Pakistan. Uh, it costs a lot of money but, but on both sides. And see, uh, we have to see the countries uh, in the region, like for example, Iran and Pakistan, they are kind of in a hostile uh, uh, relation with Afghanistan and sort of the uh, United States. For example, uh, after almost five years of killing settlers, so the Al Qaeda leader, and at the same time, the United States funding and, and helping the Pakistan government to build its army and, and its institution in terms of military. So, where do you see the, the problem? Uh, Existed. Uh, see the fight continues, Taiwan or back, it's strong for and since uh, on 2014, <coughs> troops are withdrawing, and it seems you know, it's really growing. And it's a trade to international peace, it's a trade to the region. So, uh, at, the, at, at this critical situation, uh, according to you, the solution realized how the US can get out of there. Well, thank you. We're so lucky to have you here at this conference, and I think you probably know so much more about it than I do. Let me say that I served in our army in Vietnam many years ago, and I came away believing strongly that we cannot send a person with a rifle into a country where they don't speak the language and get anything except a bad result and uh, with no diplomatic training. Um, I think we have to work diplom uh, through diplomacy. There's going to be a lot of problems. Now, uh, through my political career, I've been more on the side of non-interventionist. I suppose there are some cases where, where uh, uh, countries have to intervene to save lives if they, but that's a but I think that we have not been honest with, uh, I think our military industrial state wants to keep us in a state of continuous war. Mm -hmm. There's a new book written by Mr. Basevich up in Boston, Boston University. Uh, have any of you read that? It's about endless wars and about how we, uh, our, our whole military industrial state and homeland security state, maybe necessarily so, but we just like to keep a, keep a foreign conflict going and we love to send troops here and there. And I was against sending troops to Haiti, for example. I, I don't think it had any positive result in the long run. Now, you can say, well, you're saving lives and you can do this and that and bring order for a week or two. And but you know, in our civil war, I'm just attending, I'm kind of a civil war buff. And England almost entered on the side of the South in our civil war. And if England had done that, we'd probably still be fighting the civil war. I mean, there are some things that countries have to somehow work out and other countries getting involved um, and I think Afghanistan is one such country. So that's why I opposed originally our, uh, our going there, even though I'm a Republican and uh, 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 it was the Bush-Cheney administration, but strongly supported by Democrats, including Hillary Clinton and so forth. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, that's referred to as the good war, the Obama war. The other one is considered, I mean, this is the real partisanship that we have. It's uh, nonsense to define things that way. But, uh, 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 I do not know. I do believe that we should withdraw our troops. That's what I believe. Uh, and uh, and uh, will this leave chaos behind? I suppose, but it's going to have to be worked through. 
uh, by the people of, of Afghanistan. And I just, every day I pick up a paper and, and uh, our presence seems to be getting worse and worse. And I say this, I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings because you know much more about it. You're from there. I mean, like if you all started telling me about what we should do in South Dakota, I would be very, uh, I would qu question your judgment. So, uh, but uh, I just feel terrible about, but that's what happens when, when the great powers intervene. In, in Vietnam, we had the same thing. We had to take that helicopter out, the last helicopter people were trying to hang on. and.